Okay, we're going to start the uh, the meeting. Um, I'm going to begin by telling everyone that members of this committee are hereby advised of their duty under the State Government's Ethics Act to avoid conflicts of interest and appearance of conflict. They're instructed to refrain from participating in any matter coming before this committee with respect to which there is a conflict of interest or an appearance of conflict. Um, the first order of business I want to do is uh, welcome everyone. I um, appreciate everybody agreeing uh, to be on this committee that I asked to be on the committee. Um, I think we've had a pretty good week uh, and we're on the downslide. Um, the first order would be the minutes from the proposed uh, or the proposed minutes for the council meet on October 6th and October 8th are posted on SharePoint. And I would, uh, the minutes of the executive committee meeting of October 7th appear behind tab number one. And I would entertain a motion to approve the minutes from the October 7th, 2021 executive uh, committee meeting. So moved. All right, Sorry. do I have a second? All right. Sorry. Um, you wanna launch a poll, Peter? All yeah, in the favor poll is say launched, yes. so this is just for, um, just for members of the committee to be, to vote. Thank you. And that's unanimous. Alice, I didn't, we, we need to approve the October 6th and the October 8th minutes also, or just the executive committee? Just the executive committee. The council approves the other minutes. Okay, that's fine. Just wanted to check. Um, I want to tell everyone just, you have two agendas. One um, is obviously the main one and the other one is the, um, is the addendum. Um, the addendum has item number is listed as item number five, and that should be four. Um, so when we get down to uh, handling um, item number four, that's when we're going to go across to the uh, to the addendum. Just note that for everybody. I'm going to call something out of order because we have a guest uh, who uh, is going to make a short presentation. Uh, Evan, are you on here? Recognize Eben uh, to give the report, uh, which is item number eight on the agenda of the PMBR Cybersecurity Committee. Eben? Yes, thank you, Mr. President. Just very briefly, I've been given just a couple of minutes. We've got a crowded agenda. Just want to remind everybody the PMBR Cybersecurity Committee has uh, started out with five different work groups. We've gone through four and condensed it down and handed it over to what I call the lipstick and glitter group that's headed by Catherine Fry, Warren Savage and Patty Head. These three have just done a brilliant job of uh, figuring out how to make this accessible and uh, interesting and even funny. And they've contacted Jake Brodeur out at NC State University in the marketing department. Uh, and we have a $5,000 budget uh, item on the, on the next budget for them to work on this. And Jake, I, are you on? Yes, sir, I'm here. Hey, Jake, you got two minutes. Why don't you give us a little summary about your program and uh, what you do and, and how you're going to do it? Absolutely. So I'm with CMS Consulting. This is a business consulting, marketing consulting agency under um, the American Marketing Association. And basically, we work with real world clients like yourself, uh, doing market research, product launches, uh, similar to this, digital marketing, a lot of different facets of marketing. And we're going to be working with the PMBR group, and we're going to help get this launch of the cybersecurity initiative. Uh, what we're going to be doing is we're going to be determining the best delivery service, uh, whether that's going to be virtual online through a video service called Panopto or a presentation that we can create as well. Um, we're going to be disturbing, distributing the, or figuring out the distributing plan, um, how to get it to all the different law offices across the state, and um, just the best plan of action for that using the state bar's resources as well. And lastly, we're hopefully going to create a new name for the service. Um, we're not in love with the PMBR, so that's going to be where the <laughs> glitter and lipstick comes in. And so we're hopefully going to figure that out. Yeah. Uh, we're going to start starting next Tuesday. We have a team of about five to seven consultants with two account managers solely dedicated to this project. And we're going to wrap it up on April 20th. There's going to be a presentation where you're all welcome to come um, record it as well. We're going to have a document that outlines all the work that we did. Awesome, Jake. And uh, hats off once again to Catherine Warren and Patty. Uh, great job. So you don't need to stick around for all the dry business that's coming up, but we appreciate you coming. Absolutely. Thank you all very much.
right. Thank that you, Jake. Five, that was under five minutes, Alice. <laughs> um, I just wanted to, to make everybody aware that uh, there is uh, money budgeted to uh, handle this. It's in our budget that we're going to look at uh, here in a momentarily. So does anybody have any questions of Eben or Jake, either one, before we move on? Okay. Thank you, Jake. All right, moving right along, um, I'm going to recognize Marcy um, to give the finance report. Thank you. Um, well, the first item is not on your printed agenda, but we had the Finance and Audit Committee had a presentation um, from Lee Campbell, the executive director, and Fred uh, DeVore, the president of the Mecklenburg County Bar. Um, the unified Mecklenburg County Bar is considering bifurcation into a voluntary county bar and a mandatory judicial district bar. And as part of that process, it has proposed an allocation of its cash reserves between the voluntary bar and the mandatory bar. Um, the Finance Committee, uh, when we met yesterday, we also heard from um, some of the counselors from Charlotte as well as um, Ms. Campbell and um, Fred DeVore. And they um, gave us a presentation on their proposed allocation and um, the um, audit, uh, Finance and Audit Committee recommends to the executive committee that ex it accept their proposed allocation. And so I would need a motion um, that we approve their proposed allocation. So moved. Is there a second? Second the motion. Is there any discussion or questions? Okay, if not, please vote. That's unanimous. Okay, thank you. The next item is um, the fourth quarter financial statements, um, which were on SharePoint. I'm sure all of you have taken a deep dive into that prior to this meeting. Um, but we um, looked at those yesterday at the Finance and Audit Committee meeting. Um, and we recommend um, that the Executive Committee make a motion to the Council to approve the State Bar's fourth quarter financial statements. That's a motion that does not need a second. So um, we will launch into the Vote on that. Was there any discussion, I guess, before we do that? Anybody have any questions? All right. If not, we'll vote. Unanimous. Thank you. <clears throat> the next item is the proposed um, state bar budget for 2022. Um, and again, at the meeting yesterday, the Finance and Audit Committee um, reviewed the proposed budget. Um, and we are going to um, actually need to go into closed session later in this meeting to discuss um, a matter in closed session. And we're going to do that at the same time as the Distinguished Service Award um, goes into closed session. But um, I would entertain any any questions or discussion about the proposed um, 2022 budget? It was on SharePoint and, and there for everybody to review. So at this time, are there any questions or comments about the proposed budget? All right, if not, we'll, we'll vote later, um, but we'll skip over that for now. And we'll head to the next item, which is the proposed budgets for the various committee um, boards, including the Client Security Fund, Board of Trustees, the Board of Legal Specialization, Board of Continuing Legal Education, Lawyer Assistance Program Board, IOLTA Board of Trustees, and Board of Paralegal Certification. And all of these proposed budgets were posted on SharePoint. Um, any questions or any comments about those budgets? And if not, the um, Finance and Audit Committee recommends that the Executive Committee make a motion to the Council to approve um, the 2022 um, operational budgets for these boards and committees. Right. Any discussion about that? All right, launch the poll. 
All in favor, vote yes to approve that. That's unanimous. And the next item, there's a proposed amendment to um, state bar personnel policies. The proposed amendment um, impacts employee benefits and must be approved by the council. The Finance and Audit Committee recommends that the Executive Committee make a motion to the Council to approve the proposed amendments to the State Bar Personnel Policies that reduce the number of unused vacation days for which an employee receives compensation upon termination, resignation, or retirement from the State Bar, um, and that maximum amount would be 105 hours. Any questions about that proposal, uh, if you do have some questions, I think Alice would be the best one to probably answer that. Are there any questions? All right, no discussion. We would uh, launch the poll, please, Peter. All in favor, vote yes. Unanimous. All right, this time we'll let Marcy um, go through the appointments, uh, item number three on the agenda. Okay, the first item is the, um, the LAP board um, is composed of nine member board. Um, it's a nine member board with three state bar counselors, three LAP volunteers and three clinicians. Um, the LAP board rec um, recommends the appointment of Mr. McGuire, um, well, first of all, there is one, um, Mr. McGuire is eligible for reappointment. He's a clinician. And um, hold on one second. the Appointments Advisory Committee um, recommends that the Executive Committee make a motion to the Council to reappoint um, Michael McGuire, the clinician member, and to appoint Warren Savage, State Bar Counselor, and Anthony Flanagan, a LAP volunteer, to the Lawyer Assistance Program Board. All right, that's a recommendation yeah, I from the I need to recuse myself from this vote, I think. Yes. So well, we hap happily accept your recusal. Uh, I'm sorry. I'll I'm be taking, back. I'm, I'm taking the minutes, and I could not tell who that was. Who, that who? was Warren Savage. I'm, Warren, I'm okay. recusing oh, myself. Oh, that would make sense, Warren. Thank you. Thank for you. <laughs> we would hope he would recuse himself on other matters, but he won't, so. Um, all in favor, uh, vote yes on the poll for those three individuals for the Lawyer's Assistance Program. Unanimous. Okay, the next item is the Appointments Advisory Committee recommends that the Executive Committee um, make a motion to the Council to appoint um, Ted Edwards as Chair and Crawford Cleveland, um, lab volunteer as Vice Chair of the Lawyer's Assistance Program Board. All right, that's a recommendation from the Appointments Committee. Ted Edwards actually, uh, even though he's not a counselor, still has one more year as chair and therefore he's allowed to, to remain on there. So um, any discussion or questions of that appointment? All right, please launch the poll. Vote yes or no. Unanimous. Okay. All right. The next item, um, the North, North Carolina State Bar Foundation Board. There are two appointments to be made. Ann Reed and Dudley Humphrey are not eligible for reappointment. And the bylaws of the foundation require that all members of the board of directors be past presidents of the State Bar Council. Um, the Appointments Advisory Committee recommends that the Executive Committee make a motion to the council to appoint Mark Merritt and John Silverstein to the um, North Carolina State Bar Foundation Board. That's a recommendation of the Appointments Committee. Is there any discussion? All right, let's vote. Uh, 
that's unanimous. Thank you. Okay, um, there is one appointment to be made to the Board of Paralegal Certification. Um, Russ Neighbors, uh, former State Bar Counselor, has resigned from the board with two years remaining on his term, expiring October of 2023. Um, the lawyer appointed to replace him will complete his term and thereafter will be eligible to serve two three-year terms. Um, the appointments advisory committee recommends that the executive committee make a motion to the council to appoint Daryl Davidson, council, our state bar counselor, to the remainder of the term of Russ Neighbors on the board of paralegal certification. The recommendation of the uh, appointments committee, uh, any discussion? Yeah, okay. uh, Karen, I don't, I don't know if I have to, recuse, I don't feel like I have to recuse myself from this vote, so, no, I don't think so. No, you don't. Okay, um, thank you. All right, launch the poll if there's no further discussion, please. Unanimous. All right. Marcy, I think the next quarter, the only thing is a DH, a couple of DHC appointments. Yes. Is that right? So, yes. There's, um, right. So we have, um, there are five, but there's only one that's not eligible for reappointment um, on the DHC. And then um, if you'll just, if everybody will just check the website and Alice will po post any other appointments that will be made um, in 2022. All right. Thank you. All right, we're going to move down to item four, which is proposed amendments for publication. If you recall, um, this is the item that we have an addendum to. So you will look, um, there are proposed amendments, letter A, uh, which deal with rulemaking procedures. Um, there's item number B, which deals with border law examiner rules. Uh, and then if you look on the addendum, you will see what should be uh, number four. Uh, item C is a proposed amendment to the uh, rules of professional conduct, which were uh, with regards to confidential information rule 1.06, which was debated in the uh, ethics committee today. Uh, proposed amendments to rules of professional conduct uh, rule 1.09. Both of those have to do with uh, how to handle uh, clients uh, information after you've represented them. Uh, and then the following one is a proposed amendment to the rule of petitions for inactive status, which came out of the uh, administrative committee this week. I'm uh, going to entertain a motion to uh, adopt those or to, uh, to recommend that those go to publication. Um, and if anybody wants to pull any of those items, uh, please let me know. All right. Well, Peter, so you, Peter, what's your uh, what's your recommendation with regard? Okay. All right. Um, so, all in favor of uh, the proposals listed to publish uh, under item four, uh, if you'll launch the poll, please, Peter. Vote yes. Unanimous. Okay, they'll they'll go to uh, be recommended for publication tomorrow. Um, item number five of proposed amendments that were published, and there have been no negative comments. And I guess that still stands, right, Alice? Uh, Darren, we did actually get one comment. Okay. Um, it came in kind of late. Um, uh, Brian is here, and he can tell you what it says. It was shared with the ethics committee. Okay. Yeah, the uh, comment we received, this is regarding the uh, proposed comment to rule 1.1, uh, which uh, addresses a lawyer's awareness of implicit bias and cultural differences uh, that affect the representation. Uh, we did receive one comment during the publication period. Uh, the comment, uh, I, I wouldn't classify it as um, being uh, adamantly against uh, the proposed language, but just raising some concerns and questions about the application of the comment, but um, the ethics committee, I think both the subcommittee as well as the ethics committee 
uh, did not feel that the comment raised any new issues that had not already been considered and that had been addressed by the, the prior revisions to the proposed language, namely that the proposed language uh, is aspirational and the language uh, that's that's been uh, published uh, clearly sets it out as such. So um, the ethics committee uh, had recommended uh, uh, moving forward, uh, and Evan, you can speak to this as chair of the ethics committee. David Allen is the chair of that subcommittee as well. Um, so I invite them to offer any sort of uh, perspective as well. I think you summarized it well, Brian. Yeah, nothing to add unless there are questions. All right. Are there any questions about this? This is a, a matter that, quite honestly, I think we thought we might get more comments about, but we did not. So, um, I just want to make sure everybody understands what this uh, rule amendment indicates. Anybody have any questions? All right. We entertain a motion to uh, for this to be sent to the state bar council tomorrow for adoption. Anybody I have move. a motion? I move. Right. So move. Second. Second the motion. Second. All right. Any further discussion? All right. Um, not seeing anybody raise their hands, I don't guess, but, but I can't see everybody, but um, call it to a vote if you'll launch the poll, Peter. It passes unanimously. Okay, that'll go on to the council tomorrow for recommendation or for adoption. And if it is, then we'll send it to the chief justice for their consideration at the Supreme Court. Uh, item number six is the litigation report. Catherine Jean. Thank you, Mr. President. I'd like to ask David Johnson to please report on the two um, AP cases that he has filed in Wake County Superior Court. Thank you, Catherine. Uh, we we have, do have two matters pending before the Wake County Superior Court. The first matter involves a, a woman named Valerie Arroyo. Uh, and when she filed her answer, she filed a counterclaim. And we had a hearing uh, last week at which the judge denied her motion or denied her counter or dismissed her counterclaim in its entirety with prejudice. And the court also granted our motion for preliminary injunction. So now we will proceed to uh, finalize that case. The second matter involves a, a gentleman by the name of Brett Allen Fox, and he has defaulted. And we have currently pending before the court a motion for a default judgment of uh, permanent injunction against him. Thank you. Mr. President, we also, uh, the State Bar and some of its um, employees and um, counselors and officers are parties to a variety of lawsuits in the state and federal courts and also in the North Carolina Industrial Commission. Um, those are all detailed in the litigation report that's in your material. So unless anyone has questions, I would just rely upon that report. Thank you. Any questions? You, oh. Any questions of Catherine or David, either one? All right. Thank you for that report. We, thank we you, look Mr. forward President. to a, a report tomorrow, a full report tomorrow. A full report. I'm going to read this written report to you tomorrow. <laughs> thank you. Um, item number seven, the legislative liaison. As you guys know, we uh, have um, shrunk our committees. Uh, and one of them is the legislative committee because there just didn't seem to be a lot of work for that committee to do. Um, so, Peter, you want to tell us what's going on under the legislature now that uh, the session's gone? Well, it was gone until yesterday, and now it was, it was back, and they came back to, to vote to uh, delay the, the primary date um, later this, for later this, this spring. Um, I am still uh, actively engaged with the legislature. Um, that, that will not change with the, without, even without a, a legislative committee, and I intend to report legislative matters here to the executive committee and uh, to officers and, and any other uh, uh, necessary stakeholders. Um, we will be engaging uh, throughout this uh, off season, as you will, with the legislature to work on matters related to the dues bill and, and other um, issues that we have been 
working on for many years. I would just report to you uh, one bill that uh, one statutory change, Chapter 84, that uh, took place in a budget technical corrections bill this year. And I just wanted to share it with you just so to make sure everyone has seen it. Uh, it, it, is a, it is a bill or language that uh, changes the uh, one word in the uh, publication of state bar rules about the, the statute that uh, the language says that our rules go to the Supreme Court for, for approval. Um, it changes the word uh, may uh, to shall in the sentence that says provided that the court shall decline to have so entered upon its minutes any rules, regulations, and amendments which in the opinion of the Chief Justice are inconsistent with this article. Um, this, this wasn't a bill that we, or a change that we were involved in or knew about until, until it took place, but it does not change the interpretation that we have historically had uh, in this, with this statute and that the Chief Justice uh, had, the, uh, had the ability to uh, decline to have uh, rules entered upon the minutes if 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 he deemed them inconsistent with this article. So we did not we do not think that this changes uh, the practical application of 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 this process um, from how we've always historically interpreted it. That's my report from the legislative liaison at this time. All right. Uh, can you tell us? I I can't remember, but is the dues bill? Uh, available to be debated in this coming short session. I, I think this is short session, right? Yes, because the bill is not subject to crossover because it's a, a, a fee bill, uh, it can be uh, taken up again in the short session when that short session resumes. And of course, the other thing that we've been concerned about is trying to get the numbers back to where they were, uh, the judicial district numbers. Is that something that can be taken up also? Uh, it, that is unlikely to take, uh, to, that will, it's unlikely to happen in an election time because that creates confusion for, uh, who's running for which seat and which positions. And so that will have to be, uh, we'll have to try to tackle that again, um, after the, after the 2022 midterms, I believe. Okay. Any, any other questions of, uh, Peter about the legislative? Darren? Yes, Darren. sir. Um, and Warren, uh, this has created a problem with uh, deciding where to handle the DSA awards sometimes, the difference between the judicial districts and the prosecutorial districts. It's created really havoc. So hopefully one day they'll come to their senses and align everything like it needs to be. It, it, is, uh, it is definitely a uh, difficulty that we deal with on a on a weekly basis at the bar with confusion. Um, and, and just so everyone is aware, there's there's the difference between prosecutorial districts and, and district court, superior court district numbers. Uh, the state bar by statute goes, af goes uh, coterminous with the prosecutorial districts. That's what we call a judicial district bar is the prosecutorial district. Well, most lawyers consider their judicial district the district in which we you know the, their court district. And so uh, this creates a lot of confusion. Uh, we've worked to try to find a solution. We passed a solution through the Senate uh, to revert the prosecutorial district numbers back to match the uh, uh, superior, uh, match the court the court numbers. Uh, the House um, went the other way and and moved the prosecutorial district numbers or moved the court district numbers to to match the new prosecutorial district numbers, and we could not come to an agreement in conference. Uh, that is the status of that situation. Uh, I think we are of the uh, opinion now at the bar that we, regardless of which way it goes, we just want them to be aligned. Um, and, and we just are, are seeking a solution there. Okay. Peter, I have a question. Do you want us to contact local legislators or back off from that and allow the process to uh, run its course? Are you talking about for the district numbers or the dues bill, John? The dues bill, which well, there is will be, yeah, yeah. There will be another, uh, we will send out some guidance on how we want to uh, go about um, uh, pursuing the dues bill uh, and, and encouraging you to engage with your local, with your local legislators and send you some, some talking points and some language on that to, to do that. I mean, they're listening right now because they're running for office. So it's a good time to, 
good time to reach out to them and we'll send you some guidance on that uh, this Thank quarter. You. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Um, I just Aaron. wanted to make sure um, if uh, if he isn't if Peter's not listed on the on the meet the uh, bar council um, agenda tomorrow, uh, Alice, I'd like him listed so that we can have an update for the full council. I didn't see his name on there. I just checked. Was there someone who wanted to say something before we move on? Um, Marcy? Yeah. Yeah. I just Peter. I know that we. Um, <clears throat> I mean, we couldn't do that because we're not there, but this, um, the note writing to, are we going to do that in April? Yeah, we're going to have those in April for, for counselors to fill out um, during the, the council meeting uh, with either some pre-printed cards with, with language or with some templates that you can use with some suggested ideas to, to hand write a note and we'll deliver them for you to the legislature. I just don't want to forget to do that. Sure. In April. Yeah, that's why I want to leave. I want to keep uh, Peter to give a report for each of the uh, bar council meetings when we uh, meet on Fridays from here on out, since we don't have a formal committee. So he can remind us of things like that, Marcy. Thank you. Um, we just, we had uh, Evan's uh, report with the PBMBR, so we'll move the issues committee. Uh, Todd. Thank you. The issues committee uh, met yesterday to address um, four matters that have been with subcommittees since 2020, and then one matter regarding whether to appoint a new subcommittee. Um, and I'll take those in order. Um, the first was a report that was given to us in October um, by Judge Cobb. It was the report of the compensation of court-appointed defense counsel. Uh, and that study looked at you know, what actions the bar could take to support fair compensation for lawyers who are uh, representing um, indigent defendants by appointment. Um, we got an update on the scope of the distribution of that. Judge Cobb gave us a, a, an excellent report. And so Peter gave us yesterday um, a report on the distribution of the report to um, respective stakeholders. Um, and so that is still in process and going as anticipated. Uh, the next report we talked about was the secured leave subcommittee's report. And that was a subcommittee, uh, subcommittee appointed in 2020 to look at possible changes to the secure leave rules for trial and appellate lawyers. That was given to us in October by Gordon Brown, an excellent uh, report again. Uh, and, and it too was um, updated in terms of the scope of its distribution, Alice talked to us about her efforts to distribute that report to existing stakeholders. And, and that is going as planned as well. I don't know whether Peter or Alice wants to add anything about the distribution um, at this point, otherwise I'll go to the next report. Go ahead. Okay. Um, we then turn to reports, expected reports of two other subcommittees. The first was the subcommittee studying regulatory uh, change in other jurisdictions, um, specifically in 2020, that subcommittee started working and studying reports and initiatives from various jurisdictions uh, relating to regulatory changes in the practice of law. Uh, basically uh, looking at innovation and access to justice, quite frankly. Mark Enriquez gave us an outstanding report uh, yesterday. That report is in the materials, and so I will not cover it. Uh, he had, I think the committee had six specific uh, recommendations for the issues, to issues committee to accept and uh, consider or take up. Um, we, as we've all uh, acknowledged it's more difficult to debate matters by Zoom. And so there was a clear consensus that given the importance of the recommendations and our deliberations regarding those deliberations that was de delivered to us by Mark that uh, we ought to try to have an in-person discussion. And so there was a proper motion and seconded, which passed deferring or postponing the, dis the discussion uh, of the presentation and the recommendations until the April um, 
meeting of the issues committee. So that's where that stands again. We're, and we're going to ask the counselors and others to make sure that they study the recommendations and the, and the report and the supporting materials before the April meeting so we can show up and have a good, transparent, uh, full discussion and then vote ideally on the recommendations. Um, next, we looked at the report of the Diversity and Inclusion Subcommittee, which, which I had chaired since um, 2021, was charged with giving uh, the Issues Committee some um, best practices and recommendations about uh, actions that the state bar could take and implement relative to uh, diversity, equity, and inclusion. Um, and our subcommittee presented uh, nine specific recommendations for the issues committee um, to consider. As with the regulatory change subcommittee, uh, we want to have a full, fair, and frank uh, discussion about those recommendations. They are very specific recommendations uh, some of which may require resources and things of that nature. So uh, it was properly moved, seconded, and approved that we also um, postpone the discussion of those recommendations until the April um, Issues Committee meeting as well. And so that, that's the plan for those two um, subcommittees. The presentations were made. The materials have been distributed. We're going to encourage folks to review and come prepared to discuss and take a vote in, um, in April. Um, the last matter that we, and, and by the way, I did make the report to myself. I relinquished the chairmanship to Marcy while I made the report of the diversity committee to be proper from a parliamentarian uh, perspective um, and then resume the chairmanship thereafter. Um, and then the last matter we took up uh, was a study of whether North Carolina ought to study whether to um, take a look at um, attorney deserts in North Carolina. Uh, we have learned, the officers from some of our meetings have learned, and some of you may, may well know that a lot of states are already studying what's called um, attorney deserts, and that's simply places where uh, there are too few lawyers to serve the folks living in that area, which results in an unmet legal need, among other things. Um, Texas, California, other states are studying those issues right now. Um, and the, uh, Peter pulled the, the stats for our district bars. Uh, I think the deserts are sort of defined as places that have fewer than one lawyer per thousand residents. Uh, and Peter looked at our district bar population and, and, and looked at that data. And it's, it's been determined that 48 of our 100 counties um, could be uh, designated as um, attorney deserts using that particular definition. So we had a discussion about that. And then the um, issues committee, um, accepted the recommendation that we should appoint a study committee um, to look at attorney deserts in North Carolina. And so that passed. And so it would be up to the issues committee working with the other uh, key stakeholders and, and officers to, to figure out what that study committee is going to look like. And I assume, uh, Mr. President, you will have a large hand in doing that. So that is the report uh, of the issues committee. Thank you, Todd. Um, does anybody have any questions of Todd? I think we all agree getting on, uh, communicating by Zoom and debating by Zoom is more difficult. And I think those two issues that we have postponed to the April meeting um, deserve a full uh, conversation that where we can look each other in the eye and talk to each other. So thank you all for the work you're doing in that. Um, Andrea, do you want to talk about the AP committee? Okay. Um, the, well, first of all, the minutes of the committee are in the council materials. Uh, the next part of the report is all about numbers. And today it's uh, lucky 13. Um, the committee issued letters of caution in seven matters. 
It referred two to disciplinary authorities in other jurisdictions. Um, it dismissed two matters. It took no action on two matters and it continued two matters for further investigation. Um, that should total 13 if my, if my math is correct. Uh, then uh, staff registered five prepaid plans during the quarter. Uh, lastly, we have two action items. The committee voted to recommend to the council that uh, a plan by, by the name of East Carolina University Student Legal Services registration be revoked. And it also voted to recommend to the council that a notice of show cause why registration should not be revoked be sent to a plan by the name of complete legal plans. Um, as far as the action we need taken on the first regarding the East Carolina University Student Legal Services Plan, um, this plan notified the bar staff that it did not file a registration renewal because it's no longer operating in North Carolina. And for that reason, uh, the AP committee is asking the executive committee at this time to approve the AP committee's recommendation to for the council to enter an order that this plan be revoked. Um, All right, that's a recommendation the from the AP committee. Um, it doesn't need a second. Uh, is there any, are there any questions of Andrea about that particular action item? Well, if they're not, we'll go ahead and vote on that, Peter, if you'll Vote yes if you approve and want to send this to the uh, Bar Council for Friday. Unanimous. Right, I'm sorry to interrupt you, Andrea. I just think we ought to take those separately. So. Yeah, no, that's fine. That I was um, planning on doing that. Okay, so the next is something that does not require a motion, but it is regarding the plan um, the plan by the name of complete legal plans and um, the, uh, the AP committee uh, what wants to instruct the secretary of the, uh, to issue a notice to show cause to a plan, this plan that has not filed a registration renewal statement form or paid the annual registration fee. And as, like I said, this does not require a motion. Any questions about that? All right. Was there any other items that were action items for you, Andrea? Uh, no, that was it. Okay, all right. Thank you. you. Guys, anybody have any questions of Andrea and the AP committee? All right. Uh, Dorothy, uh, Judge Harrison Mitchell. Yes, sir. Thank you. Um, Good afternoon, everyone, again. So I am giving the report of the Communications Committee. Um, we have the wonderful joy of being able to back up and work with Peter and Brian on all things that they are doing as far as communications. And as a recap for fourth quarter, we have, and for next quarter, and continuing to do some good job on live streaming, as you all know, um, since hence we are doing so now as we speak and have been continuing to do that and will continue to do that live stream on YouTube. I have here, it may have gone up because I haven't checked um, as of right now, but 166 YouTube subscribers is what I, the last count that I had about uh, as far as other social media, about 1900 Twitter and Facebook followers. So we're moving on up as they would say, doing really, really good in that area. Um, we have had one podcast presentation since the last quarter. Um, and we are looking for, as always, um, topics to continue to do those great podcasts, any topics or um, any suggestions on people who can get on the podcast with us. We are also continuing to do work on better communication with our district bars. And so we will be getting out those templates for folks, bar counselors to use to be able to communicate with the different um, bar members and I'm so happy to report as you and hopefully all of you have seen this or found out about this already. But if you have not, please get on our new database 
that went up was launched in December. It has uh, for members for you to be able to pay your dues. Um, I think the CLE requirements are on there. Yes, I saw that. CLE requirements are on there. Um, there you can request ethics advice on that database. And then I think Peter said that we're also going to get up there um, a sponsor portal or portion for sponsors for CLE um, to get on there as well and some other things. So that's a, it's very user-friendly. It's a one-stop shop. It is much better than what we had before. And so I invite all of you all, if you have not gotten on there to please do so and encourage your members to do that as well. Um, Peter is also working on doing a video to a video presentation about the new database to, to have on our YouTube channel, as well as our website, and to have it available for district bars to be able to present that to the members. And we'll do presentations, live presentations, whether it be via Zoom or in person, um, if we're able to do that. But he is available to do that as well. And I think that covers mostly everything. One more thing. We have in our pursuit courtroom technology, we do have I think $40,000 approved to begin work on the courtroom, improving our courtroom technology. And so we look forward to that happening soon. And that is my report for communications committee. Thank you. Does anybody have any questions um, of Dorothy? Oh, wait, I do have one more thing. Okay. And I can't remember the country because I know Brian will want me to say this, but we apparently got a follower from overseas somewhere. Indonesia. <laughs> Indonesia. So I want to be sure to report that. He's super proud of that. Yeah, they have they they have a breach of contract case that they want to hire you for. That's uh, twelve million dollars, um, and all they need you to do is send your uh, your credit card and all that, so that they can process it. So if you'll just take care of that. The Matt same way I didn't send it to you. Don't you were, wire funds to them. So. Look, the same way I didn't send it when you asked for it on via email, I won't send it to them either. <laughs> I was disappointed in that. Um, I think either Alice or Peter, I think Peter sent an email telling you not to send money to me, which was not authorized uh, at all. So thank you. All right. Moving right along. Um, we will go back to Evan Rawls the third to talk about the report of the ethics committee. Well, thank you, Mr. President. Um, we had uh, 40 plus people on a Zoom call today and it went surprisingly smoothly. Um, everybody was patient, everybody was prepared, even the new members and, and we have a really, really good group uh, this year. Uh, the ethics committee did a lot of work and we've got some things for the council uh, tomorrow. We've got three FEOs that have been voted to uh, be presented to the council for adoption. Uh, it's 2021 FEO three, four, and six. Three involves charging fees separately represented parties in residential real estate closings. Four involves lawyer possession of contraband during representation. Six involves departing lawyer's email account. Now, uh, Alice, do I have to uh, ask the, uh, the executive committee to uh, approve this? Uh, no, you don't. Okay. So that'll, those, those will be in the materials tomorrow. We, we uh, voted on having one uh, 2022 FEO one uh, put out for publication. It's a proposed FEO. Council does not need to approve that. We also have two rule amendments uh, that you've seen uh, earlier. The one was the rule 1.1 adoption uh, for the uh, comment um, for competency in terms of diversity. And uh, the subcommittee that worked so diligently on amendments to rules 1.6 and 1.9 uh, Dorothy, it's going to make your podcast a lot easier if this is approved by the Supreme Court once it's uh, once it goes up, because basically uh, these rules will allow lawyers to disclose information that's in the contained. Thank you, Catherine, for that change contained in the uh, Catherine Jean, that is contained in the public record uh, with former clients. Um, 
So uh, rule 1.6, the comment is going to clarify that um, legal research and uh, writing is, is not subject to the uh, confidentiality rule. So those will be in the uh, in the in the pub, in the materials tomorrow for the full council. So it was a great meeting. Uh, we you know it's four hours long, but we did a lot of work. And um, does anybody have any questions? All right, any questions? All right, thank you for the work. Look forward to uh, seeing those matters come before the council tomorrow. So um, I will invite Warren Savage, um, if you would, uh, to give the report of this distinguished service committee. Thank you, Darren. Um, before we move to closed session, I think, Alice, I should probably bring up the issue of, uh, that we discussed on changing criteria in open session, shouldn't I? Yes, please okay. do. All right, that's what I figured. Um, so I, I think I gave you a heads up at the last executive committee meeting that we were uh, and uh, uh, that we were going to reconsider or look at the criteria for the distinguished service award in in light of a couple of recent sudden deaths and see whether um, uh, what the history of those criteria were and whether uh, we wanted to have any uh, uh, any change uh, to uh, recommend to the uh, full council and the executive committee. Um, it, it historically uh, and from its inception back in 2008 or nine, the Distinguished Service Award has only been awarded to uh, persons that were alive at the time of nomination. Uh, however, we couldn't find anywhere that that was actually written uh, written down, it just was. Um, and we've already always done it that way. Um, and I think that's always been understood as a criteria. Um, uh, having uh, uh, looked at that, looked at the reasons that it might've been uh, a criterion way back then when we first started awarding uh, the award, uh, our committee uh, reached, I think, pretty unanimous uh, uh, conclusion that the reason for that had uh, for that original uh, necessity to have to be alive at the time of nomination uh, there, that was no longer uh, needed uh, and that we would like to uh, loosen that to uh, to allow for a nomination of someone who has died suddenly uh, and, uh, as long as that nomination is made within 12 months of the date that they died. Um, I ha we vetted this uh, with Catherine Jean in the uh, uh, Office of Counsel because of the need uh, for all Distinguished Service Award recipients to have a background check. And that's like usually easily done when they're alive because they can give us their consent. Uh, however, if they have passed away, we needed to figure out how to do that. We conferred with Je Catherine Jean uh, about some language, and I have language for a motion I would like to make uh, that I think that, that has been approved by her office. Um, I don't know if she has anything she wants to add, but uh, uh, and I would like to make that recommendation. This I don't uh, anticipate this being like a a, a, a written criterion that we post on. It's just a, a, a criteria that the committee can have in its pocket when a nomination is made. So that if, if, if this, we don't want a rush of every time a lawyer dies that somebody thinks that we got to go out and uh, nominate them for the Distinguished Service Award. Okay, I mean that's that's not the point. The point is to have it there so that we have more. Uh, leeway in considering a few a few folks, especially in light of a couple of recent deaths that that were very frustrating, uh, and, and uh, would have been uh, obvious recipients uh, down the road. Um, so, uh, with that said, uh, I'd, I'd like to read what this committee is recommending. I think we wanted to get the executive 
uh, committee's approval. And then, Alice, will we then go to the full council to get approval? Okay. So, uh, and here's what I would move that the, uh, for approval of the executive committee by recommendation of the Distinguished Service Award Committee. Um, the language would be that the Distinguished Service Award may be awarded posthumously if the committee receives the nomination within 12 months of the nominee's death. Approval of the nominee is subject to the Office of Counsel's confirmation that the nominee received no public, pro public professional discipline during his or her lifetime and confirmation that there was no investigation pending at the time of the nominee's death uh, with allegations that if proven would have supported imposition of public professional discipline. That's a uh, recommendation from the Distinguished Service Award to make that, uh, I guess, technical correction to their policy and procedures. Um, and they're asking for our approval of that change. Does anybody have any questions of Warren with regards to uh, the language that he has just read out? I personally appreciate the work that the DSA did uh, with regards to this. I know that we all have our, our close friends and I think David Friedman had more than most on this bar council and, um, and Jim Fox as well. And I think this is an opportunity for us to do the right thing uh, for those two individuals at least. And, and unfortunately there will be others I'm sure down the road who pass away, who deserve this award. And for whatever reason, because lawyers are the great procrastinators, sometimes they don't get the, uh, the, the nominations in like they should. So um, if there's no further discussion, I would like to call it to a vote. Uh, Peter, if you'll post a uh, vote yes, if you approve that motion. Unanimous. Well done, Warren and your committee. And we would ask Warren to make a motion with regards to going into executive session so he can give the rest of his committee report. Right, yes. Uh, right now I'd like to move uh, into closed session pursuant to General Statute 143-318.11A2 to prevent, uh, on two grounds, uh, to prevent the premature uh, disclosure of an honorary degree, disclosure, scholarship, prize, or similar award, and subsection six to consider the qualifications, competence, performance, character, fitness, conditions of appointment or conditions of initial appointment of an individual public officer or employee or prospective public officer or employee. Sorry, I didn't have that memorized. All right, thank you. That's a motion uh, made by Warren and his committee. Uh, do I have a second for that motion to go in executive uh, session. And for those of you who didn't understand all that, we're going in to talk about the DSA award. And the second motion was made so that we can talk about consideration of the executive director's compensation um, and whether uh, there will be an increase in that. So, um, second, is the motion. There second to that. Okay. Okay. John Wilson seconded. Uh, all in favor, vote by the uh, poll, Peter. Okay, that's unanimous, and so now I'm going. All right, um, Marcy, I'd recognize you for a motion with regards to the item we took up in the uh, closed session. Well, I think that the first thing I need to do is the um, Finance and Audit Committee recommends that the Executive Committee make a motion to the Council to approve the 2022 um proposed operational budget for the state bar. All right, there's a recommendation from the Finance and Audit Committee. Only one, yeah. Are there any questions? All right, all in favor say yes to Peter's poll.
that passes unanimously. And Marcy, I think we do need to take, I do think we still need to vote on that other matter. Okay. I, I, I guess we do, I don't know. Um, okay, all right, so um, uh, we, uh, I guess we need a motion that we approve the action item that was discussed, it, discussed in the closed session. All right, that's a recommendation. Uh, is there any other further discussion? All right, Peter, if you launched a poll. <clears throat> that motion passes. All right. All right. All right. Recognize Warren. Thank you, Darren. Um, at this time, on behalf of the Distinguished Service Award Committee, I would move that the Executive Committee approve the nominations discussed in closed session for presentation of the John B. McMillan Service Award, subject to our standard due diligence checks. That would be candidates A, B, and C. It's a recommendation from the uh, Distinguished Service Award Committee. <clears throat> Any further discussion? All right, Peter, if you'd launch the poll, please. That's unanimous. Okay, all right. Great. Thank you, Warren. And just uh, finally, there is a scheduled uh, a uh, Distinguished Service Award presentation in Goldsboro for uh, Jeffrey Hulse, who we uh, uh, awarded, I think it was in October, right, Marcy, um, where we awarded him the uh, award. Um, it will be at the Goldsboro Courthouse. I know that Marcy's planning on going. I think Judge Alan Cobb is uh, planning on going, and anybody else who is, uh, Barbara Christie is going, um, so anybody else who's around and is available, uh, it's a, an honor to have uh, not just your local bar, but members, since it is a state bar award, anybody that can go to these, uh, I think it makes it even that much more special. Um, we also have other uh, awards to approve, and we are still running into uh, uh, this, the general complications of COVID and all these virtual meeting, local bar meetings. So uh, uh, we, we're still juggling that. Suzanne is unbelievable uh, as our uh, staff person and is uh, working diligently to try to get us all caught up. But we've, we still got about, I don't know, uh, I think about six awards now uh, that we still don't have scheduled, five or six. So. Anyway, uh, that's coming up, and I'll tell you more tomorrow. All right. Thank all you. Right. Thank you. Um, I think that's all of our business. Is there any new business that you know of, uh, Alice? Just would remind everybody that uh, we will uh, be coming back together on Zoom to close these uh, meetings out at 830 in the morning. Uh, so have your coffee and donut ready. and. Um, We'll, we'll get it all closed out. Thank you all for all your work this week. Um, and let's just hope we don't have to do this again. So Jeez. any further questions or comments? All right. Um, I would tell you the NCBA uh, virtual reception is going on right now. I'm not sure. Uh, I can't find the link. I thought I had saved it, but I can't find it. But it's probably – getting close to concluding. So, uh, but if you have a chance and you have the link, please, please join that. So at least there are some